Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Bren Flanagan, and I'm the Department of State's Foreign Affairs Campus Coordinator for Columbia University. In this role, I help connect these two amazing institutions. I'm thrilled to welcome everyone to the Future of American Diplomatic Leadership, a conversation with Ambassador L. Paul Bremer III, moderated by Professor Lisa Anderson. I want to thank the Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies, the International Security Policy Concentration at Columbia School of International and Public Affairs, SIPA, and fellow SIPA student, Mackenzie Crow, for making this event possible. Throughout the program, we welcome participants to post questions using the Q&A function. There will be an open Q&A during the second half of the program. I will now briefly introduce our two panelists. Ambassador L. Paul Bremer is the very definition of public servant. Ambassador Bremer's diplomatic service spanned eight U.S. presidents. He was special assistant to six secretaries of state and Henry Kissinger's chief of staff. President Reagan appointed him ambassador to the Netherlands and then ambassador at large for counterterrorism. In 2003, President George W. Bush recalled Bremer to government service as the presidential envoy to Iraq, charged with beginning the country's political and economic reconstruction. When Ambassador Bremer was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, our nation's highest civilian honor, President Bush said, quote, our nation will always be grateful to Ambassador Bremer and his good work. Thank you for being here today, Ambassador Bremer, and thank you for your service. Nice to be here, thank you. I'm so pleased Professor Lisa Anderson is moderating this conversation. Dr. Anderson's academic career and expertise span includes field research and numerous university appointments in countries around the world. Dr. Anderson is also no stranger to the politics of the Middle East. Dr. Anderson was president of the American University in Cairo from 2011 to 2016, leading the university during Egypt's political revolution. Prior to her work in Cairo, Dr. Anderson was Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia for 10 years, engaging with world leaders ranging from President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad of Iran to Secretary General Kofi Annan of the United Nations and further building SIPA into the public policy school of which we are all proud. Dr. Anderson also teaches the course I have immediately following this event. So without further delay, I pass it to you, Dr. Anderson. Thank you very much, Bren. This is a really uh, delight to be with all of you um, and an opportunity to really think a little bit about what SIPA should be teaching students and thinking about preparing people for. Um, so Ambassador Bremer, I'd really love to have you tell us in 10 or 15 minutes what you think the world is going to be looking like for these young people, if you will. Then I'll have a few questions and then we'll open it up to audience questions, which Bren will be helping to manage. Sir, it's a delight to be with you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Bren, for that nice invitation to uh, be with you all. So I wanna leave you with three thoughts today, which I'll outline at the beginning and then swing around and come back to later. First of all, the world order, the American led world order that we've been living in for the last 75 years is in danger of collapse. Secondly, history shows that when a world order collapses, it can collapse with frightening speed. And thirdly, I believe there really is no other alternative to deal with this very serious situation than renewed American leadership in international affairs. Those are my three basic points. Now, if you study history, and many of you no doubt do, you will be familiar with the idea that the reigning hegemon or the mightiest country of a given time seeks to impose its values on whatever part of the world, if not the entire world. And most in history, most hegemons have not been dedicated to a liberal world order. If you think of Spain under Philip II in the 16th century or the Ottoman role in the 16th, 17th century, the French under kings or revolutionaries, or think of China, 
whose dynasties go back almost 2,000 years and during which China was, and now is in Asia, certainly a hegemonic power. None of these are liberal. Now, what do I mean by liberal? I'm using the term not in the American sense of the word, but in the European sense of the word and the sort of uh, historic sense of the word. Liberal means a system which promotes liberty, individual liberty, individual rights. We have them in our Bill of, Bill of Rights. The individual gets to choose the government that he or she's going to live under through some democratic or constitutional process. Liberal means the rule of law. Liberal means an open world trading system and the freedom of movement around on open seas. That kind of a liberal world order, which we have been living under, is very recent and it is, as I've already implied, an exception to the historic rule. Effectively, this world order is only 180 years old. It was put into effect by the British who were after the Napoleonic Wars, a hegemonic power. And the British, through a series of uh, political and economic laws, opened up British society, outlawed slavery, espoused a liberal world order, and put the Royal Navy to sea to police the commons, the watery commons, to promote free trade. Britain carried out that role for the rest of the 19th century and tried to resume it after World War I. But at, after World War I, already Britain was exhausted. And America reverted to its isolationism. After World War I, we simply withdrew uh, from participating in trying to reestablish a world order. And the result of what, ha of what happened was that the world order collapsed with frightening speed. Of the 26 parliamentary democracies, which were in existence at the end of World War I, only 12 were still in existence as parliamentary democracies 20 years later in 1938 at the outbreak of the Second World War. It took only 20 years effectively for the world order to collapse essentially completely. 20 years is not a long time in history. That's the distance between 9-11 and today. So the threat of the world order coming apart is serious. America took over Britain's role in 1945 at the end of the second world. And we promoted the liberal kind of the liberal values that Britain had been promoting in the previous century. And it was a stunning success. If you look economically, the, in the 50 years since 1950, in the 50 years since 1950, the, the worldwide gross domestic product grew 10 times as fast as it had grown between the years 1500 and 1820 when Britain began establishing its world order. Let me repeat, the economy grew 10 times as fast, 10 times as fast as any time in human history. There was an enormous spread of these kinds of liberal values around the world. Now here's the problem. Today, politicians in both of our political parties and many Americans are saying to themselves, we've sort of had it. We don't want to be the world's policemen. We don't want to be involved in all these overseas operations, these quote, endless wars, as people have called them. Uh, we want to retreat. And there is an illusion that, and this was an illusion in the 19th century in America, that we would be safe behind what politicians then called our walls of water. In other words, we are effectively a continental power surrounded by more or less friendly neighbors and by two large oceans. And we can retreat behind our walls of water safely and wash our hands of the responsibilities of being the world's hegemon. But pay attention to what is happening outside the United States. Freedom House, which is a nonpartisan think tank located here in Washington, DC, where I live. Freedom House reports every year on the advances and declines in freedom around the world, the kinds of freedoms I mentioned. Freedom House report for 2020 
said that we have now had 15 consecutive years in which the number of people living in freedom has declined, 15 years already of decline. 75% of the people alive in the world today, according to Freedom House, do not live in freedom. This is a huge challenge for us Americans. We need to get back in the game. We need to re-engage and both parties are needed to make this happen. I'm, I'm still here. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I, I can't, uh, my, uh, <laughs> my capacity and technologies, I mentioned a professor beforehand are not substantial. <laughs> that was a phone interrupting. So I'm, I'm finished, Professor. Let me turn it over to you. Um, thank you for that. I, I, um, I wondered what you attribute this, if you will, collapse or disillusionment with the liberal world order. You describe it as something that is certainly partly internal to the United States, but obviously, as you talk about, you know, freedoms around the world and so forth, there seems to be beyond the United States, a measure of disillusionment. To what, is, to what do you attribute that? Why are we confronting that now? Well, I think, in, I'll, I'll try to answer it in terms of the United States. I, can't, I don't know about the rest of the world. Um, one lamentable fact, and I'm glad that it's not the case at Columbia, one of the lamentable facts is that we don't teach history very much in our, uh, many of our universities. Uh, and my view is that you can't really uh, speak and act responsibly in world affairs unless you understand history. It's not that history always repeats itself, but as the great American philosopher Mark Twain said, uh, it may not repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes. So it pays to look, for example, at the collapse of the international order in 1918, after, after the First World War. What happened? Why did those democracies disappear? Uh, so that's number one. Uh, we also don't teach geography, but that, that's a separate question. Uh, there is a long tradition of American isolationism. After all, from roughly 1776 until, say, 1898, uh, we were pretty well occupied with trying to be, get a, be a continental nation. We had the problem of slavery, which took a civil war in the middle and afterwards. And we lived for the of our time, we lived uh, uh, effectively in isolation. So there's a tradition of isolation in America. Uh, I like to say that we were torpedoed into the First World War when the Lusitania was sunk and we were dive bombed into the Second World War uh, at Pearl Harbor. It took a lot to get America engaged, so it's gonna take a lot to get us back. And thirdly, of course, we've been involved in endless wars, as they are called, uh, in the Middle East. So in terms of the American uh, withdrawal or disinclination to retain leadership, I think those are the reasons I would um, I think your your um, reference to history is certainly preaching to the choir on that one, but I wonder whether there wasn't, there isn't a sense, and it is partly these endless wars, of sort of American overreach, that the United States has taken on this role in a way that has been essentially costly to the country itself, as well, presumably, as costly to some of the other parts of the world. Um, and so that doesn't seem like there's a great deal of rationale for continuing it or trying to rebuild it. And at the same time, you are concerned that if we don't rebuild it, it will be worse in some way. So how do you think you make the argument to people who sort of say, this is American overreach. The United States has been doing things it should never have tried to do in the first place. 
Well, I can understand that. We have borne quite a, a burden uh, and, and successive administrations, starting with the Truman administration, have been angry, angry, maybe too strong a word, critical of, for example, our European allies not doing as much as they could to protect that we were doing to protect them from the Russian, from the Soviet empire. We'd had similar discussions with our allies in South Korea and Japan endlessly about how much they're prepared to do. And that argument goes on and we've actually had some progress under, under the Trump administration and uh, already under Biden. He's, he's already uh, been able to get the South Koreans to come up with some more money. So we have to explain what you rightly say is uh, uh, anxiety about the burden. Uh, I can't, I'm not a politician, so I, I can't tell you the, the argument to be made, but I can say one can point to the downsides rather clearly of what happens if we don't carry out this, this burden. I mean, maybe there are ways to share it better. I'm all in favor of that. But we can't just think we're going to retreat to our shores and uh, the world will be fine. It won't be fine. What will happen? What are the, you know, sort of as you think about the, you know, worrisome things out there in the world, what will would happen? Well, I'm concerned about the uh, renaissance of four ancient empires. Uh, the Russians, the Chinese, the Ottomans, and the Persians, all of whom do not wish us well, uh, several of whom have their eyes on the lands of our allies, allies we are committed to defend, particularly in the case of Russia, in the, in the uh, uh, Baltic states, uh, in the case of Turkey, in the Middle East, and the Iranians there also, and in the case of China, effectively all of Asia. Uh, if we are prepared to live in a, in a world where those kinds of powers can exercise effective control over their regions, we're going to live in a world that's going to be very dangerous to American interests. And that's a case that has to be made by politicians. Uh, academics also obviously have a role, journalists. Um, Bryn, I hope you're collecting questions because I have a few more. Of course, I have hours of questions, but let me. Um, but I just, I, as you talk about the liberal world order, I think you correctly start with the British. But of course, the British were, were a very important imperial power. And there were many people who are not beneficiaries of the liberal elements of that empire. Sure. So there's a, a measure, I think, fair, a fair measure of skepticism that this is not actually just a, you know, second order imperial, you know, escapade on the part of the United States that having taken over that role from the British, um, how do we, how do we as the United States think through the skepticism about the liberal elements, the fact that many people have heard the word used in your sense, um, and but haven't experienced the life of a liberal world order? Well, you know, it's a fair question. We, we face in a way, as you suggest, Professor, something that the problem that the British had in the 19th century. Uh, on the whole, I think the people under British, under the British Empire enjoyed more freedom than they had under whatever they'd been before, usually some form of despots. Uh, but the British also had to wrestle with the question, particularly in the case of India, which they didn't really resolve until after the Second World War when they essentially left. Uh, and it was not a tidy departure left lots of problems that are still there today between Pakistan and India. So it takes knowledge of history. It takes a lot of patient explaining. Uh, again, I come back to the politicians. Politicians in a democracy are understandably um, concerned about their next election. In, in our case, sometimes it's only two years away if you're a, in the House of Representatives. So you're perpetually uh, in an elect re-election campaign, it doesn't make for long-term strategic planning. It's not an easy thing to do with a big government. It, it was done most successfully, I think, at least in my lifetime by Harry Truman 
in the period between 1945 and 1951. It was an extraordinary operation. He was served by one of the great secretaries, two great secretaries of state, George Marshall and Dean Acheson. And they put together a strategy and it was basically followed for the next 70 years. It takes very skilled people and, and we, we have to produce them. I don't know where they are. They're at university somewhere. They're already in the foreign service. Who knows where they are? They're all at SEPA. Don't worry about it. They're here. <laughs> <laughs> sign them up. If I were a contractor, I'd come signing contracts right now. <laughs> okay, I have one fight, one question that you, you know, obviously anticipate, but let me um, just pose it and then Bren can uh, look at what other people are interested in. But, you know, as you say, you are a student of history, as I think we all should be, and you therefore even alluded to the untidiness of the departure of the British from uh, India, from their empire there. Um, uh, there are many people who think the departure of the United States from Iraq was pretty untidy as well. Um, to what extent does a historical perspective help us understand how the United States got into Iraq and got out of Iraq, or as it happens, sort of is this endless presence? Yeah, well, it's obviously a long, a long story, uh, and I don't want to take all the time to go th through all of it. Uh, I believe that the problem we had in Iraq was a, pro a problem that the administration, in this case, it was the Bush first, second Bush administration, had a goal which was to liberate the Iraqis from a dictatorship and get them on the path to a representative government and a more or less stable economy. That was, those were the two things I was asked to do. And we were always under-resourced and there, it took a long time. It took until 2006, two years after I left, for President Bush to finally come up with a strategy to effectively um, put the security situation in hand. And it took, he had to fire his Secretary of Defense, he had to fire the Secretary, uh, the Chairman of the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff. He had to put in effect a surge and put more troops in there in 2007, eight and nine. And that actually worked. Uh, that did defeat, um, that did defeat at that time, it was still called Al Qaeda. The, but the problem was, that the next administration withdrew all those troops at the end of 2011. In other words, there wasn't the kind of steadiness that has been successful in protecting, for example, Europe for 70 years from the Russians. We, we didn't have a, a broad government-wide strategy, long-term strategy. We didn't commit enough troops to provide security in the beginning. There were these kinds of mistakes that happened. And the result has been, uh, been what we've seen. Now, I just would add, uh, the Iraqis, when they, the new prime minister took office uh, in Iraq two years ago, it was the fifth consecutive democratically elected government in an Arab country. There's no other Arab country that's gone that far, based on a constitution, which the Iraqi people themselves wrote and approved in a referendum. It's not to downplay their problems. They've got lots of problems, on the, particularly on the security side now, and obviously the economy because the price of oil has dropped. But none of that uh, takes away what was actually accomplished. We'll see how, you know, the story's not over yet, obviously. And it, it's different in Afghanistan, different situation. But that I, I can answer more directly from direct knowledge about Iraq. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Bren, I'm sure you've got a list of people, so why don't you give us some questions? Yeah, thanks, Professor Anderson, and, and thank you to the attendees who have already submitted questions. Again, we invite everyone to use the Q&A function to pose their questions during the program. Ambassador Bremer, I have a few categories of questions here for you. Um, the first one does concern Iraq, so I'd like to just stay on that for a few more minutes. 
Um, and there are kind of two overarching questions. One, I'm sure you've had many times in your career, um, and I'm happy to share interviews that you've given answering this question more in depth if attendees are interested, but if you could speak just a little to the coalition provisional authorities decision to disband the Iraqi military and the debathification process and the relationship with the insurgency. Sure, sure. Uh, I'll try to be brief. First, debathification. The Ba'ath Party was established by Saddam uh, right after, by, by the Iraqis, not Saddam, uh, right after the Second World War and taken over by Saddam in the 1960s. It was, it became Saddam's political instrument of control of everybody. Uh, Ba'athism was a, a, an ideology like in, in a sense like communism that was replete throughout all the system. All the textbooks, for example, were at, at schools in all the subjects had references to Ba'ath ideology and it was a effectively a dictatorship. In the run up before the war, I was not in the government, but the State Department held conversations with Iraqis all around the world uh, and some in Iraq about what post Saddam uh, role there would be for the Ba'ath Party. And the, the view was unanimous, the party had to go. It was viewed uh, as corrupt. It was effectively part of Saddam's muhabarat or secret service. They, they, engaged in na they engaged neighbors to spy on neighbors, children to spy on their parents. I mean, it's, it's a, a textbook like the Nazis. And so the unanimous recommendation of the uh, Future of Iraq project, which was done by the State Department, finished in 2002, the year before the war, was that the Ba'ath Party should be effectively disbanded. And it, and it was. And uh, just briefly, we took polls. We did a public opinion polls every couple of weeks while I was there for 14 months. And we always asked about the debathification. It, it was by far the most popular decision that the Coalition Provisional Authority took. It never polled below 94% approval. So that's the bathification. Now the military was more complicated. Um, the problem we had was that the, the military essentially deserted its post in, in the April 17th. So three weeks before I was even in government, uh, the Pentagon reported that there wasn't a single unit of the army the Iraqi army standing to arms anywhere in the country. They'd gone home. And this was a, an army that was about the same size as the American army, about 715,000, uh, with almost entirely Shia enlisted men. It was not a voluntary army. They were, it was a draft army and Sunni officers. So, and so there was a huge tension uh, in the army and basically as I said, they went home. So the problem we faced, the question we faced was, do we recall Saddam's old army or do we create a new one? Recalling Saddam's old army, I was told by the Kurdish leaders would lead them to basically withdraw, secede from Iraq. They were not going to be under Saddam's army again. The Shia who represent probably 60% of the population were cooperating with the coalition uh, under instructions from Grand Ayatollah Ali Sistani. And they told us, the leaders there told us that if we called back Saddam and had Saddam or Saddam's army, we would have Saddamism without Saddam and they would stop cooperating with the occupation, so which would have been a, 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 a catastrophic failure. So we basically either had to recall the army or build a new one. We decided to build a new one. Now, people have argued first on bathification, that this stripped government of all of its people. It's not true. Debathification affected only the top two officers in most ministries, the minister and the deputy. They had already left the country. They all got out when they saw which way the war was going. And the, and the, bureau, the bureaucracy worked. They, they kept working. Now, it was not a modern bureaucracy. What do I mean? Well, there was no national telephone system. You couldn't pick up the phone and call somebody somewhere else. There was no ability in the banking system to transfer anything but actual physical dollars. They couldn't, there was no electronic transfer. 
There were no computers in any of the ministries except the Ministry of Planning. I could go on. Somehow, the Iraqi bureaucrats were able to keep these ministries going the entire uh, 14 months that I was there. People say, well, didn't disbanding the army create uh, or encourage al-Qaeda? You know, I don't exclude that some of the people that uh, were left the army joined uh, al-Qaeda, but they didn't do it because they had no economic opportunity. That's nonsense. The, the economy grew uh, dramatically in 2003 and even more dramatically in 2004. So if they joined the, uh, if they joined Al Qaeda, they joined it because they didn't agree with the idea of having a democratic Iraq. Thank you, Ambassador, for, for that answer. We have another question from uh, Ray Harris, who actually served with you uh, in 2003 in Iraq, but his question is more broad uh, relating to your original remarks. And he asks, where do you see American global leadership's role in strengthening liberal institutions after the recent turmoil of the American first doctrine of the Trump administration? Well, thank you. First, Ray, thank you for your service uh, to the country. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, and I, I mean, I broaden the question because I think it's a, it is certainly a problem uh, with the American first orientation of uh, the former president. But uh, the Democrat Party is now the majority party and it's really their responsibility, certainly the executive anyway, to try to articulate a broad strategy for re-engagement. And it is always complicated in America because we are an idealistic country. We, we don't like seeing other people. I, I said 75% of the people alive today do not live in free, free societies. We don't like seeing what's going on in Xinjiang, in China, where the Uyghurs are, are subject to what some people call genocide or at least uh, you know racist uh, prejudice. We don't like to see that. On the other hand, you always have to balance America's interests in these freedoms with our strategic interests. We don't particularly, I think, want a war with China. So we have a, a very broad range of things we have to talk to China about where we have to balance our strategic interests, our commitments to the allies there, Korea and Japan and the Philippines, and our interest in freedom of travel through the seas, particularly the South China Sea. <clears throat> so there are no um, th there's no easy answer. The important question, <clears throat> important thing is that people ask the question, how do we balance our interests? Thank you, Ambassador. We have another set of questions <laughs> that, you know, push this notion of American exceptionalism a little more. And I think we could group them into type two broad categories. One, how do you respond to people who, who think that American exceptionalism doesn't exist, that we, we shouldn't be taking this role? I know you alluded to it in your introductory remarks. And then more broadly, some, some students wonder, how, how can we justify it um, in, in their view since American presence abroad hasn't ensured uh, economic opportunity, it, whether it be free wages, widespread elections around the world, more democratic transitions, um, compared to when America assumed this leadership role? Well, uh, I believe in American <clears throat> exceptionalism. I don't know where there's another country with our vision, our history, and our willingness, at least until now, <clears throat> to exercise uh, leadership. So uh, that's, a, that's a basic definition of exceptionalism. And I think the the list of the liberal uh, characteristics that I went through earlier, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, all those things. I think they are quite exceptional actually. Uh, and and it, we, we should promote them because we believe in them. Now, on, on the question of, I, I'm not too clear about justifying. I mean, our engagement I referred to earlier in Europe after 1945, uh, courageous decisions by Truman certainly helped keep Greece and Turkey from falling into either the Soviet uh, arc of influence or losing out and, and reverting to dictatorships or autocratic. Uh, autocratic. 
The Marshall Plan, which where we spent billions of dollars in what is now Western Europe, certainly helped stabilize those countries to the democratic freedoms that they own now. I don't think our record is, uh, is all that bad. There are certainly places where we didn't succeed. Uh, the fact that Japan now lives under a form of government that they had never heard of before, or South Korea, the same. Those are due very much, I think, to the strategic commitments we made to them as allies and also to, in many cases, the post-war uh, reconstruction funds that we made available and the, and the war we fought in Korea in, in 1950. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, some students are wondering how you see the role of social media in the evolution of American leadership and the challenges um, that foreign policy will encounter in the future. And of course, the Arab Spring comes to mind, the use of Twitter and Facebook to really engender mass protests and topple regimes that had been entrenched for decades. So how do you see that as that continues to evolve? And then a second ping of that question is, do you think this is going to continue to be exploited by international terrorist groups like ISIL and Al-Qaeda? Well, as a uh, sort of post Facebook or pre Facebook uh, expert here, I'm not too good on social media. Uh, I'm just barely with you here uh, on Zoom, holding on by my fingertips. Um, it is clear that the, the social media uh, has an upside and a downside. The upside is it allows people uh, to communicate without having to go through uh, government regulated media, to use a, a term, which means that social media uh, are an opportunity or a threat, depending where you sit, to places like Turkmenistan or Kyrgyzstan or China. Uh, it's very hard for autocrats to control social media. Uh, of course, there is another reverse side of that, which is therefore very easy for them to use social media to interfere in democratic uh, societies as happened here in the election of 2016 and presumably 2020. So it, it's a double-sided double sword, double sided edge. Um, from a diplomat's point of view, it's, it's an opportunity if you're assigned in a country where you can use social media. It certainly is a way to reach a larger audience of the people talking about whatever it is America wants to talk about. But it, it, does, it does have the risk uh, and of, of being used against us. And uh, you mentioned terrorists. I mean, the terrorists also can benefit. We've seen what was perhaps a, a terrorist attack, certainly an illegal attack on the water supply, I think in, in Texas somewhere where they turned on some bad stuff, salt or foam or something and tried to put it in the water supply of the city. That kind of thing uh, is made possible, not so much by you know, Facebook and stuff, but by, the, by cyber, cyber security or lack of cyber security. And that's gonna be a problem. That is a very big problem already with the military. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh now we have a set of questions that focus the geographic um, issue back to the Middle East, but more broadly. And Ruba from Saudi Arabia wants to know how you see U.S. influence and credibility to influence Middle Eastern affairs after um, the war in Iraq. And then Aiden wants to know, kind of on a more domestic focus, do you ever see U.S. support coming back to have American leadership play a, a, a large role in the Middle East? Well, I think um, I think in the I think the Middle East is is in flux. There's no question about it. The, you have the leadership change. Well, just like you have Tunisia initially, uh, then Egypt, which went the other way. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, you have a transition going on from uh, one king to the crown prince. Uh, it, it, it's a place in in serious flux. I, I think the, to its credit, uh, the Trump administration was able to encourage, I don't know how much they influenced, but anyway, encouraged the opening, which led to what the Abraham Accords, as they're called, where several of the Arab countries uh, effectively have made, more or less made peace with Israel. 
uh, which has the effect of putting the Palestinians in a difficult position because they can no longer take for granted the support of uh, the Arab countries, uh, which anyway, that support anyway, has been rather modest considering the fact that the Palestinians have been in exile since 1948. So uh, the, the, how much America influenced that, I, I don't know, but it certainly was, it didn't stand away from it. Now, the, the key problem in the Middle East from an American point of view now is I Iranian interference in pretty much every one of uh, the, her neighbors, starting with Afghanistan and going all the way around to uh, Yemen, to Saudi Arabia, to Bahrain, Kuwait, uh, the UAE, uh, which is why the Abraham Accords are so important because they are a way to start organizing uh, uh, somewhat the, the the political context of the region. And I think America can be uh, effective there. It will not be if uh, we now pull all of our troops out of Afghanistan, because I think my view is there, the Taliban have no intention of carrying out the agreement that they have, uh, that they have signed. Uh, or pulling substantially out of Iraq, where the fundamental problem the government in Iraq has is something like 150,000 militia, almost all supported by the Iranians, who are not part of the National Command Center. They're not under national command, which they should be. So uh, America is going to have to, uh, even though I know there are long wars and all the stories, uh, I, I think we're going to, we would be wise to stay engaged in Afghanistan and Iraq, not because of the Afghans or the Iraqis, but because of the Iranians. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, now going back more broadly to, to the world order, we have a group of students who, who say, agree with you that America needs to be the exceptional leadership power in maintaining this world order. But they also wonder, you know, is it incumbent upon us to encourage or really mandate that our European allies take more of a, a burden in ensuring this world order? How do you see the interaction between the United States and our European allies in sharing the burden of maintaining this liberal world order? Well, that's a very good question. And it's not a new question. It's basically been on the table since NATO was founded in 1949. Uh, we've had this discussion I served in several NATO countries myself uh, as, an as a diplomat. Uh, it's, it's a perpetual discussion. The problem we have is that the Europeans, although it appears because they've got the European Union now, it appears that you might hope that there would be a more consolidated and um, forceful European part, but that is not the case because underneath the European Union, the countries continue quite understandably to assess first their national interests. The French are very much engaged in Africa, parts of Africa that none of the other Europeans really care much about, except to hope that they don't get a, a bunch more immigrants from the, uh, from the North African shores. Uh, the Germans have an instinctive and understandable historic reserve about engaging, although they did, they do have forces in, uh, um, in Afghanistan, NATO does, uh, but it's a, it's a real stretch to take an organization called the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and saying you gotta have troops in landlocked Afghanistan, which has no water anywhere near it, but they've done it. So it's gonna take uh, a lot of careful diplomacy with the Europeans and the Europeans are going to have to try to figure out, the, the debate has started as people will know, what exactly is going to be the military component of the European Union? Is it going to have a military component? And if it does, how does it relate to the existing NATO structure? It's a very complicated problem. Some of it is beginning to be solved a bit by deployments, new deployments of American forces to the east of where they used to be, into Poland and Lithuania. But uh, it, it, it's, it's a very good question, and it's going to be one that this administration and others are going to have to wrestle with. Thank you, Ambassador. One question students had kind of as a follow-up to that is, 
how does that become contextualized in an immediate threat for those who aspire to live in the world order like people in Myanmar right now? People where? In Myanmar. Well, I mean, there, I talked earlier about how there's always, in American foreign policy, there's always a need to balance our attention to what are broadly called human rights, which would certainly be the case in Myanmar, uh, and our strategic interest in whatever the part of the world is. Uh, Myanmar is a particularly difficult situation because uh, the, the opposed leader was a Nobel Prize winner and uh, the guys who've taken over are not showing an awful lot of respect for anybody. Uh, and the problem for America is that Burma uh, is, is essentially within the Chinese description of their, their arc of influence. And the, indeed they have done several belt and road projects there in Burma, a port and some tr uh, train, train tracks. So Burma presents a, a, a dilemma for us. And since one of the countries which can help us in our efforts to counter Chinese hegemony in Asia, one of the countries is India, which also has interests in Burma and, and in, their own, in their own provinces, which actually adjoin Burma and Bengal, for example. So it's a, it's a complicated part of the world right there. And uh, I, don't, I don't have an easy answer to what we do about Burma, except we should, as this administration has done, strongly condemn this wanton use of force, particularly in the last couple of weeks, it's just shooting people who are protesting in the streets. Thank you, Ambassador. And kind of transitioning to Asia and China, the challenge of China more broadly, a group of students, you know, note that President Biden recently convened the members of the Quad, namely uh, India, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan to meet. And the students posed the question, do you see, you know, our, our real ability to counter China and check the influence of China be acting through these alliances? Or do you think it's going to be a more unilateral push from the United States? Well, it has to be uh, through the alliance, whether it's that particular group or not. Uh, it, it, we can't do it on our own uh, any more than we could have on our own counterbalanced the Soviets in Europe for the 50s and 60s. We needed the Europeans to be with us. Uh, I, I, I think our problem with China is our major foreign policy problem now. We, we need to be very careful because we're drifting towards a confrontation over Taiwan, uh, which is a red line for the Chinese. They don't like us mucking around in Xinjiang and talking about Uyghurs, but Taiwan is a serious issue. And we won't be able to put, we need to put in place a, a coherent strategy with political, economic and military elements in order to balance away uh, China so it does not become uh, an aggressive hegemon in that region. And that will obviously depend vitally on Japan, Korea, Australia, and India, and obviously others, Thailand, for example, Vietnam, which after all spent a thousand years under the Chinese, they're not very fond of the Chinese. So there's, there is um, a possibility, but as was the case in America between 1945 and 1951, we need a strategy that is coherent and can be explained and supported by the American people. Dr. Anderson, I'll hand it back to you, but I've got one more question from the students and it, it brings it close to home, uh, Ambassador. And I know you're not a politician, but we're curious on your perspective of this as well. You know, in the past couple of years, we've seen an incredibly polarized environment in US domestic politics. And students wonder, you know, how, does, how do you see that challenge in, in enacting foreign policy abroad when it's becoming difficult sometimes for American politicians to agree on what the strategy should be at home? Well, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, that is a correct uh, assessment of the situation. It is very difficult to speak credi credibly abroad when we don't have uh, at least a coherent broadly bipartisan approach to whatever the problem is. Uh, it could be the problem in Burma, it could be more importantly, the problem in China. And uh, I'm hopeful, uh, President Biden uh, 
served a long time in the Senate and was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee while he was there. He's knowledgeable. He's met most of the leaders of the world in his previous role as vice president. And he's got a, a, a seasoned group around him. Uh, I think they have a lot of uh, both at the Pentagon and at the State Department, CIA. Uh, in other words, the potential is there. And the question will be, does this group put together and explain and get support for a, a, a re-engagement of America, despite all the problems we've had, the pandemic, the, the uh, fracturing of the political, the Republican party, the Democrat is also under some stress. Uh, there are real challenges, but we don't have, I have to say the luxury of simply saying, we're gonna to tend to our own problems here because the problems in the world are not gonna go away. They will come back to us. And if we're not prepared, it's gonna be very messy. Thank you. Let me sort of begin to wrap this up with a few uh, questions that sort of, I think are reflected in the way the students have posed what are actually excellent questions as you have seen. Um, I think part of the dilemma to go back to this issue of the liberal world order is how to be realistic to put it in international relations terms to balance interests um, and values um, and how to do that without seeming like not simply indispensable, but hypocritical. We talk a good line about human rights and how important we think it is and so forth and so on. And we keep walking up to the edge of the water and then backing away and saying, well, you know, we have to balance that with our concern about, you know, in Myanmar, we have to be worried about China, for example. What are we worried about in Ethiopia? You know, it does make me wonder whether the Nobel Committee ought to step back for a little while since so many of their, <laughs> but, how do we, you know, what kind of language should we be using to, to describe this to the world that doesn't seem like a lot of empty rhetoric that we don't follow up on? It's a very good question because it, it is a dynamic tension always. Uh, you know, the, the time that I could cite for my own government service uh, would be the debate in the early 1970s leading up to the Helsinki Accords in 1975. Uh, in fact, it, it would be an interesting assignment for you to give to some of your students. Sorry about that, students. <laughs> How did the Nixon and Ford administrations um, sustain the uh, military and political support for NATO against Russian um, interests, while at the same time following what was called Basket Three, which was the part of the Helsinki Accords that dealt with human rights, broadly speaking. I mean, how, how was it explained? It was done. We were able to actually do those two things. Now, you know, the world has a way of intruding and, 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 and um, determining your agenda when you're president. But th that's the case where it was actually done. And it might, there may be some useful um, work there. I, 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 I don't remember, but I know we did it. On a similar sort of trying to look forward, we need to presumably better articulate the kinds of relationships we see between American interests and American values. Um, and that's going to have to undergird any efforts to um, rethink a liberal world order. Um, there's also talk on a much more practical level, perhaps, and again, I'd like your um, you know, perhaps you can reflect on your own experience. There's a sense that the State Department itself really needs to rethink the careers of FSOs to reorganize itself. And some of this is criticism of the secretaries under Trump. And some of it is a more long-term, broader concern that we just aren't training or providing career incentives and so forth for the best and the brightest to represent this country. And I wonder if you could sort of reflect a little bit, both from your own 
experience in the department, but also how you see the kinds of responsibilities that people are going to have if whatever the United States does, even if we end up being isolationists, we still have to be able to explain that to the world. Um, and it's not clear that we're equipping anyone to be able to ex you know, explain this relationship between American values and American interests. It's a good, it's a good pro question and a difficult problem. Uh, since I've been away from state for well, 30 years now, I, I'm not the best person to ask, but I can say that in my view, when, when the State Department is working well, and I've seen it work well, uh, it becomes not the only, but a major uh, factor in how a president defines his national security policy. It does require that you have really good people, that they are encouraged to think outside the box and that you have a secretary of state who is listening uh, and challenging and so forth. And we've had secretaries of state who've done that. Uh, Dean Acheson, George Schultz, uh, a number, Kissinger. Um, and, 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 and if that's your objective, you have to take a look at the whole recruit, recruiting uh, system. Uh, I did a study on the personnel system as my last job in the State Department, actually, 1989. Uh, our recommendations, you will not be surprised to hear, were completely ignored, but, but that's, the way, that's the way things go. Uh, there's no reason in the world why the State Department can't be the most influential part of putting together a national security strategy if you have the right people and you encourage them. What are the right people? They got to know history. They got to speak languages. They got to understand the culture of other countries so that they can put themselves in the place of the other country to explain to the United States, why are the French always behaving this way? There's a reason. You have to know what the French history is. There's a reason why uh, the people in Gujarat, Gujarat are different from the people in other parts of India. I mean, th these are the kinds of things which a, a person needs to go. It calls for sharp analytical skills, obviously a background in history and language and stuff, but sharp analytical skills. And there's no reason why the State Department couldn't be the best. I, I, don't, I don't know enough about how their current recruiting is going to critique it. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think, um, if I may, you have sort of given us a great tour de horizon from the perspective of somebody who has thought about American foreign policy for a very long time. Um, and I think this has been instructive and useful. I want to congratulate the SEPA students. As always, they ask the best questions. Um, and so I hope that you found this uh, fruitful and interesting conversation. Um, there's never a dull moment with students from this school. And no, they did great questions and uh, they're going to there be plenty of them in the Foreign Service at some point. Before I we close, uh, so. Ambassador, I just wanted to ask very briefly, um, I saw a talk you gave where you shared a quote from President John F. Kennedy that he would have given uh, about the role of American leadership in the world in Dallas, Texas. And I wondered if you recalled that quote off the top of your head, if you could share it with us to close. I, I, I don't remember it, I'm sorry. <laughs> it, it, in, in essence, it was America's on the walls of freedom and, and uh, it, upon us to, to give that, yeah. but I thought it was very notable that was in Dallas. Yeah, that, that, yeah no, yeah, it was that. Basically, we've got to be on the walls. Yeah, exactly. Thank you to all participants for coming. We really appreciate you taking the time um, out of your afternoon. And, and thank you, Dr. Anderson and Ambassador Bremer for, for this very, very, very uh, fascinating conversation. Thank you, Brent. Thank you very much.